Hello, this is Christy Shriver. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit Podcast. Today we're discussing one of Thornton Wilder's great plays, for which he won a Pulitzer, the more famous one, Our Town. And if you're tempted to think that because he wrote one play about a small town, that Wilder is a sentimental, folksy, small town kind of guy, you need to read uh, the other play, which earned him his third Pulitzer, and that is The Skin of Our Teeth. It's strange in its conventions and like our town, but completely different in every other way imaginable. So, Christy, are we going to study this play? Well, we're not going to study the skin of our teeth. I do want to take a look at another piece by Wilder after our town for our supplement. Uh, but I think uh, I, it'd be more interesting to look at the novel, The Bridge of San Luis Rey, because it's about Peru. Uh, and I love Peru, and it was very, very popular at the time. So if you want to stay ahead of the game and hang out with us, um, I know that that book is harder to get, so you may want to order it. you got a couple of weeks. Take a Take a ride over on the bridge of San Luis Rey and see what it's all about. But let's get back to the skin of our teeth. You're right. That is a different play. It's apocalyptic about man-made natural disasters. Pretty much the exact opposite (laughs) of everything about our town. Well, last week, as we always do, we really focused on the life and times of Thornton Wilder, the man, which is a man that you really like. That's true. He's a well-traveled man. It's hard to pigeonhole him. Nobody really understood him. Uh, There is a sense that he really considered himself more of a global citizen, which is something that I really appreciate and I think really gives him an interesting perspective. He's quite non-judgmental, really, and I find him very endearing. (laughs) Observational, not judgmental. Yeah, exactly. In my view, knowing that bit about his biography before I watched the play really gave me a different perspective uh, in which to appreciate how to look at his work. When you look at it at first pass, it's easy to think he's a small town guy, just kind of glamorizing small town life, trying to say, let's remember the good old days. But really, it's the almost exact opposite of that. I think that's really true. And if you read uh, any literary criticism, a lot of people, actually serious people, Look at our town exactly the way you just described it. A look at the turn of the century sort of thing. Uh, The problem is, from my perspective, by taking that kind of angle on the play, it could be seen as provincial or insensitive. You can almost say it's condescending, maybe elevating American Anglo-Saxon culture, perhaps above other cultures. And I guess that's one way to look at it, but... To me, that's a very unsatisfying way to approach the book. And of course, this is true of all of life, not just literature. There's many ways to look at anything, and we have to respect all of them. But for my money, I just find this play much more interesting to look at it cosmically, not think of it as a provincial play. But being a person raised around the world, you're seeing my biases, and I tend to lean toward the global perspective, and so that's definitely uh, the perspective that we're going to see here, looking for the commonality of the human perspective, which I really see a lot in the play along those lines. So having cleared the air, suggesting that we're going to look at it this way, which is not the only way to look at it, I do want to take one more little tangential side trip down uh, an academic lane before we revisit Grover's Corner for the second time. And it's a tangent I think Wilder would want us to take. A tangential what? We're going to go down a road. <laughs> <laughs> Are we sidebarring? <laughs> yes, but I wanted to use the road metaphor. It's a book oh, of um, oh, art. <laughs> so, good grief. Where are we going? To the theater, of course. Wilder wrote extensively about what he thought a trip to the theater should entail. In fact, he actually, as you might expect, being a playwright, had strong views on the topic. So I wanted to kind of start with our discussion today, paying attention to what theater is all about. It's not as obvious as you might think, at least it wasn't to me. The first thing about theater that makes it different from other types of literature is that it's meant to be performed and not read. I mean, isn't that obvious? Well, of course it's obvious. But what you don't think about is how that angle changes the experience entirely. For one thing, it engages two senses, both your eyes and ears. 
actors are interpreting the words and the actions and the directors and producers are, are also spinning the views of the writer and interpreting the world. A lot of the experience is drawing inferences, like a part of your experience as the viewer is drawing emphasis about what's motivating characters by watching what they do instead of reading their inner monologues and how we know they're thinking inside. Also, in a play, the action basically has to happen in a very few places, depending on your budget, maybe just one, because it's expensive to build a set and you can't very easily build multiple sets for a bunch of different things. So those are all things to consider. But so is this is this why he went without a set? <laughs> <laughs> that would be my thing. He was trying to be budget conscious. No, yeah. uh, but no, uh, I think this is where Wilder wanted to camp out. Uh, he thought of and really heightened the idea that reading is a private action. It's a personal experience. Even if you're in a book club, you're basically having a private interaction between the writer and yourself. But this is not what happens in plays. Plays are communal. We yeah. experience them as a group. We experience them together. If the play is supposed to be funny, it's much funnier if other people are laughing. If it's sad and the lady next to you has a tissue, you might be a sympathetic crier. I can be a sympathetic <laughs> crier. <laughs> the, the feelings that we get are going to be intensified because we're not feeling them as an individual. We're feeling them as a member of a body, a larger body. So to make my point, I have to bring up again, I know I've done it before, Mamma Mia, my oh, very favorite there it is. <laughs> play. Uh, I know I've talked about it, but I love going to see Mamma Mia. I never get tired of it. Last year, my dad and I went to theater, Memphis's performance of this play. That's our local community theater here. Uh, and it's a fantastic theater. But anyway, the playgoers are closer to my father's age than mine. It's just the way that it is. Anyway, the last time we went to see the perf uh, this performance of Mamma Mia, of course, the show was sold out and they had to add performances because everyone loves that play. But when you get to the end of the show, they have this part where everyone just kind of stands up and joins the chorus on stage. And when we got to that part in the show, well, there were older women sitting around me, you know, the kind, the blue hair, the <laughs> strands of pearls, the canes, anybody, everybody, no matter how how old they were, what they were wearing, no matter anything. They were all standing up, dancing and swaying and singing. And it was awesome. And it was contagious. And of course, I had to jump up and I was singing with all them too. And I didn't even know these people. We were just in it together. And that's where the joy comes from. You get this every once in a while uh, when you go to um, movie theaters even if they don't have live action. I don't know if you've ever been to one. Have you ever been to one of those? I remember when I was a kid, we went to see Rocky IV. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in a downtown theater in Belo Horizonte. It's a really old-fashioned one. I may put a picture of it on the on website. But anyway, they wooden seats, you know, old building. But at the end of the movie, the entire theater, all of us, and it was packed out, was literally standing up on top of these wooden seats and we were yelling, Rocky, Rocky. <laughs> I mean, I can remember it. Yeah. Now, you don't get that. That's nothing that you can experience watching something on Netflix from your sofa by yourself. Indeed. That, and I'd like to point out when you're watching Netflix, if you watch a comedian uh, on Netflix by yourself, it's not funny. No, you're it's, right. It's funny if somebody it, else is in yes, the room with you. Yes, hmm. and, the, and, and there's energy there. And I think even yeah. the actors and especially comedians, they feed off of that kind of stuff. Very much so. Well, uh, I don't want to get too psychological here, and I won't, but when you read Wilder's lectures on theater, it's very Jungian, the way oh. he talks about the whole experience. <laughs> And he was deliberately trying to tap into something we've talked about several times in various episodes, and that is the idea of the collective unconscious. I'm not trying to promote Carl Jung above other people, but what we have found out in studying theater, studying books, studying poetry... He's a big deal. They're, well, the themes are repetitive, and they show up in all these different stories. Uh, anyway, just remember that Carl Jung argued that there were archetypes and images and patterns and ideas that are basically hardwired into our brains and are identical in every single person. Well, maybe not so much identical, but they occur 
commonly. So it seems Wilder thought good playwrights were essentially tapping into what was communal about our common experience and and deliberately creating art designed to bring everyone to one common emotional place, which is a pretty sophisticated skill. He says this in the introduction to his book uh, with the three plays in it. He says, the theater is an art addressed to a group mind. It presupposes a crowd. It requires a throng. The theater partakes in the nature of festival. And then he goes on to say, this means that the dramatist must treat the material by necessity to be understood by a large number of people. And I love that. And it's exactly what I'm talking about. I think we feel that. It's not something to really think about. When you go to a theater or a concert or even a lecture, this is not a private experience. You were not an audience of one. The presenter is not speaking to a crowd. He's speaking to a group mind. He even used the word mob. We're just one part of a larger body. And I will say, I kind of feel that when we started the podcast and instead of a microphone or like talking in front of a classroom, you're talking to a, a microphone instead, and there's just not the same energy. <laughs> <laughs> there's no interaction unless you're willing to sure. email or chat back on Instagram or something like that. You know, you kind of get lost in the fact that this is a group. It doesn't feel like a group, and there is a loss there, I think. Well, and, and how timely, because although technology is always helping create more community experiences virtually, it's definitely something that's not simple. I mean, this is very evident when you experience the difference between a class in a physical classroom and an online class, since I've done both. Every student will tell you there's a huge difference in a class one-on-one where students and the teacher are together in a physical room where they are of one group mind, like he's referring to. It's not just the same experience at all for anyone. I mean, the presenter or the students in this case. No, and I'm glad you brought up teaching because Wilder, and I don't think I talked about this last week, but I should have thought of himself as a teacher, which of course I have to love that. Even after he was famous and rich and successful and all that, if somebody were to ask him what he did for a living, he would always say he was a teacher. Now, I don't really know why. Maybe he just didn't want to invite questions because teachers are common. And so people would just say, oh, okay. But it might be, and I think this is certainly partly true, if not entirely true, is that's how he primarily thought of himself. He thinks of himself as a teacher. And I know we're going back into a bit of biography and we need to move to Grover's Corner. But I wanted to read this little excerpt about an account of the way this man taught In 1953, there was an article about him as a teacher, and he said this. This is what the article said. He would fling his hands about, jump from the platform, and leap back again, talking at trip hammer speed. He was sometimes in front of the classroom, sometimes in the back, sometimes at the window, waving to his friends. Wilder could play the blind Homer, a Greek chorus, or the entire Siege of Troy. Even his pauses were planned with an actor's timing to keep his audience in suspense. Wilder even says of himself, teaching is a natural expression of mine. So he loved it. And he's the kind of teacher that I would have loved to have. So the reason why I think this is interesting when you think about our town, it might be nice to think of it as a lecture instead of a play or a lecture play. (laughs) I think it's a great idea. And one of the things I read said that when Wilder showed our town to a playwright friend at the time, a man by the name of Edward Sheldon, Sheldon said, you've aroused no anticipation, you've prepared no suspense, you've resolved no tension. In other words, you've written a bad play. <laughs> and what is this? <laughs> yes. You know, and he, if well, if you took my advice, basically, and watched it between this last podcast and this one, you may have had that same experience and said, what the heck is this? So this week, If you want to go back and rewatch it, and I hope you do, or if you read it, one way to think of it, just try not to think of it as a play at all, but as a lecture, a series of musings on the universe, and think of the stage manager as the lecturer or the teacher. But don't think that it's got to be like this really difficult lecture where he's trying to confound you. Remember, he thinks this has to be so simple a mob could understand it. That's, <laughs> that's what he says. That's a low bar. <laughs> I know. He think, he's just kind of showing you stuff. Wilder himself said, 
The function of the play is not to reveal new truths as much as to trigger those that lie in everyone, like the archetype thing, like the mm-hmm. young man thing. So thinking of it that way, should we go to Grover's Corner again? Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> Wilder, the professor, and I know you don't mean Professor Willard, I mean the stage manager, is presenting a lecture series on the nature of life. Not even life in Grover's Corner. Life on planet Earth. And Grover's Corner is just simply Exhibit A, or one example of that's, Earthlings. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's just one example. It's not something that's supposed to be elevated above any other group of people. And what is it about life that we should be able to see is what he's wanting us to think about. So last week you asked me a question and I kind of blew it off. Do you remember what you asked me? <laughs> <laughs> you, mean, you mean when I ask you what in the world was Wilder doing with time in this play? Because everything was somewhat out of order. Yes, that's the exact question. In the opening lines, the stage manager tells us the actors and so forth, name of the town, where it exists, latitude, longitude, blah, blah, blah. But then he says this. The first act shows a day in our town. The day is May 7, 1901. The time is just before dawn. And then, which I find strange because there's nothing on the, on the set, you can hear a rooster crow. And then he says this. The sky is beginning to show some streaks of light over in the east there, behind our mountain. The morning star always gets wonderful bright the minute before it has to go, doesn't it? So there is a lot of attention given to time all over the place. When they talk about the schoolyard, they say things like this. High school still farther over there. Quarter of nine mornings, new times, three o'clock in the afternoons. The whole town can hear the yelling and screaming from those schoolyards. When he talks about the train, he talks about it getting ready to flag at 545 from Boston. And when he does, if you'd notice, the stage directions tell the stage manager that at that moment, he's supposed to take out his watch and nod. At the end of Act 1, George and his father are talking, and his father brings up the fact that it's bedtime, and the son says, it's only half past eight, very much aware of time. I'd like to argue that if you watch this play again or read it, think about what it's saying about time. And remember, time is expressed in a lot of ways, not just hours, but it is expressed by hours. And this play, the play opens at 5.45, but it ends three acts later at 11 p.m. So this kind of gives us this feeling, a strange impression that the whole play is just one day when it's actually 15 years of people's lives that are going by. And that's kind of Wilder being the European modern playwright that you don't think about channeling his expressionism that we talked about last week. He's injecting some of that you know, sophisticated technique into this little, simple, made-up New England town. And it is appropriate to say that New England folks, by the way, I think really do run their lives, according to clocks, more than Southerners. We have a (laughs) reputation of not paying as much attention. (laughs) Seven o'clock means (laughs) seven-ish. Yes. We'll we'll ballpark it. (laughs) Uh, But back to this um, universal perspective for a minute uh, that I want to talk about. They're not just running their lives according to hour. They're also running it according to the patterns of time. And those patterns are far older and more cross-cultural than just time or the ability to run your life on a tight schedule. I mean, the moms are picking beans and planting flowers that's seasonal looking at time in the sense of seasons of the year. But we also see patterns about seasons of life. The doctor's helping twins come into the world. His kids are teenagers. The parents are middle-agers. It's it's all very distinctive. And time is going by, and yet it's not. Uh, it feels like Wilder is interweaving metaphysical concepts with the most set of circumstances that he could think of in as generic a place as he could think of. Yes, and that's where we get to that archetypal stuff. There are things we share in common with each other across cultures, even if the individual details of our lives are very different from the details of the lives of these other people. Um, There are seasons, even if we're not white Anglo-Saxon New Englanders from the turn of the 19th century. We're seeing life through their culture, 
but it could in a sense be all of our lives. And that's kind of the point of act one. I'll give you an example of something that's not time related sort of, but it is kind of a universal architect that relates to time. So if you look carefully at the first act, you're going to see this guy, the milkman. First of all, I know most people don't get milk like this anymore. We, I've always gotten milk at the grocery store. <laughs> Well, now Amazon will do it. <laughs> yeah, not as cool. But let's get back to Howie Newsom. So Howie Newsom is the milkman. And look at his role in the play. It's kind of interesting. He's featured in every act. And the question is, why feature this guy? In the beginning of the play, he brings by the milk and he drops it off and he comments on the birth of the twins. Now, milk is not an archetype as far as I know. But water is in the kind of a milk. And I don't think it's stretching so far to say that they kind of are representing the same kind of thing because we associate milk with nourishment and growth and that's kind of where water it goes with general archetypes so i think what wilder is doing he's kind of building into the play this idea of a cycle of life birth growth death rebirth the passing of time and this little character is kind of a reminder of that I'll show you where he surfaces again in the second and the third act, and, and you'll see this kind of evolving. There's also a lot of water in both a second and third act, too, and they kind of function the same way. So uh, what does that mean? Is he saying that we should pay attention to the passage of time or that we shouldn't? I don't think you can tell that in act one, but there is one last thought be before we jump into act two. I mentioned last week, that we end act one staring at the moon and it's a really peaceful ending. First of all, I love the moon and I love looking at the moon and I know lots of people do, but the moon is a huge archetype. And interestingly enough, think about what it represents. Moons represent change and cycles, just like in science, the moon represents a cycle, the cycle of time, a cycle of life. So we end this play kind of shifting to this idea of there's going to be a cycle and we fade from them looking at the moon into act two, the next cycle, love and marriage. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I noticed act two starts with all these time indicators like we talked about in act one. Uh, sun's come up over 1,000 times and then he changes courses with this line. He says, nature's been pushing and contriving in other ways too. A number of young people fell in love and got married. Uh, I like that line. Uh, almost everybody in the world gets married. You know what I mean? In our town, there aren't hardly any exceptions. Most everybody in the world climbs into their graves married. <laughs> yes, he very casually drops back into these references of time. He also references Howie and the milk, Mrs. Webb needs more milk. They have company. That's what happens over time. You expand. But there's also water in this act too. Rain, which can represent, again, both life and death. Back to cycles. The passage of time is being fleshed out again and illustrated with these two very basic families, the Gibbs and the Webbs, who are incidentally getting ready to be connected permanently through the marriage of their children. There's also a lot of references to death, which is kind of strange. I think kind of interesting. George is going to say, lots of guys do this, but it, it's brought out in the play, only five more hours to live. And Mrs. Webb threatens the, to kill him if, well, says threatens. You can kill yourself when you're alone, but you better put your boots on because she's, you know, rattled about the wedding and she's insistent that the water isn't going to get him sick and kill him. Well, the conversation between George and the father, the groom, is kind of cute. I mean, uh, as a father who was given a daughter away, I was able to identify with the sentiments. I mean, it's a pretty special moment to uh, stand there in the back of the church with this child that you brought home from the hospital years earlier, and now they're a full-grown adult getting ready to get married. So it's it's pretty special. I know. And getting away from archetypes, motifs, themes, literature, and all that kind of stuff— I think there's a lot special in this act and there's a lot that's so relatable and enjoyable in the sense that you just referenced. He's right about everyone getting married. It is a central part of the human experience. And although we didn't have a wedding like they did in Grover's Corner, we played up as I kissed the teacher <laughs> in ours. Of course, uh, from Abba, <laughs> of course, connected to Mama Mia. But anyway, it's the cycle oh. of life. <laughs> Wilder really ramps up the emotion on 
this side of, of this very moving love scene, we're going to see that it's not the ceremony that's important at all. It's this emotional journey of the experience of the wedding. And that's kind of what we share in common around the world, not necessarily the routines and the cultural representations in the ceremony. This little American experience is just one tiny example of things that are happening everywhere. And we're reminded of this when he asks the question, he says it like this, how do such things begin? Meaning this love thing that everyone knows about that I'm giving you one example of from one little part of the world that's quite remote, you know, that thing that you have to in whatever context you're living in. Well, the the soda fountain scene really reminds me of my hometown in Lawson. Um, when I was in high school, I worked at the local drugstore where they had a soda <laughs> fountain. As a matter of fact, it was the only soda fountain in Ray County, Missouri. Okay, And uh, I actually made drinks by mixing Coca-Cola syrup and uh, carbonated water and all the ice cream dishes and, you know, malts and shakes and and uh, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's really interesting that uh, the small town life of uh, Grover's Corner was a lot more similar to my experience. I mean, you grew up in a town in Brazil of what, 4 million people. <laughs> I yeah. grew up in a town of 1,500. Well, yeah, and this is where our two, two roads are different. I didn't even know what a phosphate was until I read this play. And honestly, when you took me to Lawson for the first time a few years ago and I went into that drugstore on Main Street and saw them making those things, I couldn't believe it. I thought I'd fallen into a time vortex and I'd landed at the turn of the century. I didn't know people still did that. It's cool, though. Well, it is cool. It, it, it was a lot of fun. It was a great memory to have. And of course, by this point in the play, it, it's not even awkward that the stage manager is running a soda shop and we don't even notice anymore that it's all pantomime and that, that there's no soda shop. And it's not surprising at all to see the stage manager show up to be the minister. I mean, it's like, well, who else would be the minister in this play? Right. And if you're reading the play, you may not know, notice that. But if you're watching it, you'll see that there's not a set, there's not a soda shop, there's not a church at all. Just people kind of walking around and then of course wilder the teacher slash minister slash soda shop guy slash everything but he's going to come out and he's going to give us a little lecture on marriage it appears that it's a little religious but it's not really religious it's maybe metaphysical even though he calls it a sermon uh, Gary, give us a little read of this minister's sermon at this wedding okay <laughs> And being as far in the South, I can't uh, imitate a New Hampshire accent, yeah. so we'll have to go with what we have. <laughs> <clears throat> you see, some churches say that marriage is a sacrament. I don't quite know what that means, but I can guess. Like Mrs. Gibbs said a few minutes ago, people were made to live two by two. This is a good wedding, but people are so put together that even at a good wedding, there's a lot of confusion way down deep in people's minds, and we thought that that ought to be in our play, too. The real hero of the scene isn't on the stage at all, and you know who that is. It's like what one of those European fellas said, every child born into the world is nature's attempt to make a perfect human being. Well, we've seen nature pushing and contriving for some time now. We all know that nature's interested in quantity, but I think she's interested in quality too. That's why I'm in the ministry. And don't forget all the other witnesses at this wedding, the ancestors, millions of them. Most of them set out to live two by two also, millions of them. Well, that's all my sermon. It not very long anyway. <laughs> it's unusual. And obviously, you know, marriage, he's identifying it as the heart of life, I guess. It's certainly the middle of the play. But what do you think about this presentation of a wedding? It's just strange. And the conversation between Emily and her father and Mrs. Sums going on about how lovely it is. It's just so lovely. And there's just a lot of emotion and very little by way of what would you would actually expect to witness in a wedding ceremony. Well, it's, it's him one more time doing the uh, universal identification of emotions that are common to everybody in very common life situations. And uh, I don't know that I have a really deep importance on, on that, but he obviously thinks the emotions of the wedding are far more interesting than anything else going on. 
I think so too. I think maybe that's the commonality that we're supposed to be seeing. But read the last uh, of the stage manager's comments here at the end of this act. I've married over 200 couples in my day. Do I believe in it? I don't know. M marries in millions of them. The cottage, the go-kart, the Sunday afternoon drives in the Ford, the first rheumatism, the grandchildren, the second rheumatism, the deathbed, the reading of the will. He now looks at the audience for the first time with a warm smile that removes any sense of cynicism from the next line. Once in a thousand times, it's interesting. <laughs> and that line is so interesting. I mean, everyone thinks weddings are these big events, these glamorous aff affairs that define people's lives. And he says once in a thousand times. And this is after he's already told us he's only done 200 weddings. That means none of them are interesting. <laughs> is it, are we to say that Grover's Corner in particular has, is, is known for its boring weddings or what are we to make of that? Uh, I'm going to guess we're to make of the fact that it's a, it's in the cycle of life. It goes on <laughs> so long and has gone on for so long. How does it stand out? Well, the, the last line of the second act is also given to Mrs. Psalms. And she says, the important thing is to be happy. And if you think about what Wilder says, his plays are supposed to be about, I think he's saying, so what if it's interesting? So what if it's not interesting? It doesn't have to be. The wedding is not the thing at all. It's nature contriving, as he says, to make a perfect human being. Yeah, and I've thought about that. You know, it doesn't have to be interesting. It's not interesting. And maybe that's what we love about it. Weddings are, are about the sense of hope, a hope for happiness. It's so it's such a wonderful thing. You can almost hear those women saying that. That's what they like, future expectations, a hope for future success. You know, we all fall in love at least we want to, and that's a nice part of life. It makes your life story. It's your life cycle, whether uh, it's basic or, you know, freakishly romantic or whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter. It can still be happy. And that, to quote Mrs. Soames, is just lovely. <laughs> just lovely. <laughs> it's a sweet act. It is. It is. And a big contrast with Act 3 that we're going to see. Yeah, which I guess we'll drop into that next week. We will next week. And so if you have enjoyed our metaphysical walk with Thornton Wilder into the archetypes of life, <laughs> uh, then come back next week and we'll finish it up. We'll get into Act 3 and, and look at the end there. So uh, as we always like to encourage you, Tell your friends about the podcast. Bring them along for all the good times that you're having. Check us out on Facebook. Check us out on Instagram. Look us up on howtolovelitpodcast.com. You'll have all kind of great information about all the literature that we cover. So thanks again for being with us. Peace out. Peace out.